In this video, we'll be looking at the region for the neck. Now, it's possible that this video is going to end up halfway between a dissection session and a kids' TV show. That's because although we'll be talking about anatomy, most of what you'll be learning about is triangles. You see, the neck is a small but surprisingly complex region, and dividing it into smaller, three-sided spaces helps us to more accurately describe the location of structures or pathologies. If we start with a lateral view of the neck, we can see several muscles, but the one I want to concentrate on is this one here, sternocleidomastoid. Now, sternocleidomastoid, or SCM to its friends, can seem like a daunting name to learn, but this muscle is just named after its attachment, so it attaches to the sternum here, the clavicle or clido, and then finally to the mastoid process at the base of the skull. The muscle is normally fairly prominent, so a great landmark for getting your bearings in the neck. It also bisects our neck into two major regions. In front of SVM is the anterior triangle. This is bordered superiorly by the mandible and medially by the midline of the body. Now there are several important structures that can be found in this triangle, but to see these more clearly, we need to move to an anterior view. First we have the hyoid bone, with the laryngeal cartilages hanging down. We also have groups of muscles that allow the hyoid to move up and down during swallowing and speech. The group above the hyoid are known as the suprahyoid muscles, and these all work together to elevate the hyoid. Within this group are four pairs of muscles, so forming the floor of the mouth is the mylohyoid. Deep to this is geniohyoid, which I haven't actually drawn out, but that hopefully gives you an idea of how much you should worry about it. Next we have digastric, an odd little muscle that passes from the jaw to the hyoid, but then back up to the skull. This splits it into two distinct bellies, one anterior and one posterior. Finally, the stylohyoid muscle comes down from the styloid process of the skull. Below the hyoid are several long thin muscles that help to pull the bone down. These are the infrahyoid muscles, although they're sometimes known as the strap muscles because of their shape. All of these muscles are named after their two attachments. For example, one of them passes from the sternum to the hyoid, so we call it sternohyoid. Deep to this, the muscle passing from the sternum to the thyroid cartilage is known as sternothyroid. We then have a small muscle found between the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone, which you may not be surprised to learn is thyrohyoid. The final muscle runs from the scapula to the hyoid. Now, calling it scapular hyoid would make a lot of sense, but we actually use the less common prefix omo, making this muscle omohyoid. Now, that isn't the only odd thing about this muscle. Instead of passing directly between its two attachments, it forms two muscle bellies that run at different angles. This helps me remember the name of the muscle, because whenever I see this unusual shape, it makes me say, Omohyoid. Generally speaking, it's more important to know the names and actions of the two muscle groups, rather than the details of individual muscles. However, knowing these muscles can be useful if you want to divide the anterior triangle into more precise spaces. If we return to the lateral view of the neck, we can draw these regions out. First we need to colour in the hyoid bone, then two of the suprahyoid muscles above it, stylohyoid posteriorly, and then both bellies of digastric. Finally, we'll highlight omohyoid, heading down, and then back towards the shoulder. Under digastric and above the hyoid is the submental triangle. There's not a huge amount to worry about here, but you can find some submental lymph nodes. On the other side of digastric, bordered by the jaw and stylohyoid, is the submandibular triangle. This also contains lymph nodes and parts of the facial vessel, but most of this space is occupied by the submandibular gland. Below the hyoid is a broadly triangular space formed by the anterior borders of omohyoid, sternocleidomastoid, and the midline. This contains the larynx and the other infrahyoid muscles, so it's known as the muscular triangle. The final region lies here, between digastric, omohyoid, and SCM. This is the carotid triangle. 
as the name suggests, this contains the carotid artery, which divides into internal and external branches just below the level of the hyoid. It also contains the internal jugular vein and vagus nerve, which travel alongside the artery within a fibrous tube known as the carotid sheath. Now, because these structures are relatively superficial at this point, the carotid triangle can be a good access point for surgery. We also have a dilated swelling just after the formation of the internal carotid, known as the carotid sinus. This is the main baroreceptor of the body, responsible for measuring blood pressure within the vessels. If cells within the sinus detect elevated blood pressure, they'll set off a series of events to bring that pressure down. But this process can also be triggered by external compression of the sinus. Now this could be useful. If a patient have elevated heart rate or hypertension, massaging the sinus can help to ease that issue. But in some people the sinus is far too sensitive and even light contact or compression can result in the blood pressure dropping and the patient fainting. So that's our anterior triangle. And you probably worked out that if we have an anterior triangle in front of sternocleidomastoid, we'll find a posterior triangle behind it. The other borders of this space are trapezius posteriorly and the clavicle inferiorly. Again, we can subdivide this triangle into two smaller regions, this time found on either side of omohyoid. Superiorly, we have the occipital triangle, named after the occipital bone that lies above it. The main thing you'll find here are nerves. These generally emerge from under FVM at a location known as the nerve point of the neck. Most of these nerves are superficial branches that head to skin over the neck and head. But we do also have the spinal accessory nerve that supplies trapezius. Now if this nerve gets damaged and trapezius loses its function, then the muscle can atrophy and the patient will lose that shape over the top of the shoulder. The final triangle is inferior to omohyoid, and this is the subclavian triangle. This region might be small, but contains some major structures, such as the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus. This means essentially all of the blood and nerve supply to the upper limb is passing through this space. So if you're ever working in this region, make sure to take care. A small misstep could have far-reaching consequences for your patient. So that's an overview of the triangles in the neck and their major content. In case you missed anything, I've added a summary in the description, as well as some flashcards. But as always, if you have any questions or problems, please just get in touch. Other than that, thank you for watching, take care, and I'll hopefully see you soon.